Last week, we had a special guest, Dave Armstrong, uh, who uh, gave us a, um, a, a great teaching on the development of doctrine, what the Catholic Church means about this development of doctrine. And we're fortunate enough that uh, Dave is going to jo join us again. Through the miracle of electronics, um, he hasn't been on hold for a week here on the telephone, uh, but we do have Dave with us again tonight. Dave? Hello? You're still with us? Still here. Okay. It's a long time waiting for a week. <laughs> <laughs> I hate to see your phone bell. <laughs> Last week, Dave, we got into some, um, uh, we were talking uh, kind of, uh, what would you call it, I guess, um, educationally or technically uh, about some some issues uh, such as the development of doctrine and, and how uh, Cardinal Newman uh, had written his essay and how that brought you even more firmly into the Catholic faith. Um, I wanted to ask you tonight if we could, I want to spend some time just talking personal issues. Um, I am a revert uh, to the Catholic faith. I was um, raised a Catholic and had left the Catholic Church for a period of time, and now I'm back. Uh, but that, that's not the story that we're going to tell tonight. The story that we're going to tell tonight, I want to hear from you. Uh, you, have, you are a convert to the Catholic faith. And in talking to, especially from evangelical Protestantism, which really had no uh, sacraments, no, um, at least no uh, refined liturgy or high liturgy or anything like that, uh, I know I was, I, I, when I left the church for a while, that's what I was, uh, that's what I went to, uh, was just a very basic Bible only um, type of Christianity. Coming from that type, of Christianity, there are a lot of issues to deal with. Uh, I know that, and I'm, I'm sure you know that too. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight. I want to know how you, how did you deal with issues like, and I'm going to, I'm going to bring someone, I'm going to ask for your opinion on them. Um, one of them that we talked a little bit about last week was the issue of the infallibility of the Pope. Uh, but through scripture and through uh, development of doctrine and everything, you did you did explain a little bit how you handled that. What were some of the other uh, issues that could, did Mary give you any problems? Well, not as much as you would think. With most Protestants, that's probably the issue. Um, I don't know why that is, except that I, I just had really good Catholic friends who. We were having group discussions at the time, and I would ask them about Mary because it fascinated me. And my friend John, whom I mentioned in my story, the, the one who recommended Newman, he started telling me about the idea of the new Eve or the second Eve, which is a motif in the fathers. And um, what that is, this was pretty much a new, totally new idea to me at the time. I'd ne it never occurred to me, or I never thought about it in that way, but it, it fascinated me because it is fundamentally biblical. So what you have there with the new Eve is, it's, you might call it an analogy or, well, that's a good word, where Eve was disobedient. She said no to God, in effect. And Mary comes along, and in the Annunciation, she says yes. I will bear God in the flesh. So that begins uh, redemption history in terms of Christ and the Incarnation. So in effect, it reverses the no of Eve. So that's the uh, notion of new Eve or second Eve, which is really the basis of all later Mariology. From that, you go to sinlessness, mother of God, perpetual virgin, and so forth. Those are all... That probably broke down whatever prejudice I had against it. So, so Mary, you were fairly familiar with the Catholic teaching on Mary before you even considered converting then. Um, in, well, with your, the discussions that you were having with your, with the, uh, uh, as you described in your conversion story, yeah. uh, they, 
they were familiarizing you already with uh, with most of Catholic teaching. Um, and again, that would be uh, uh, come under one of the things that we talked a little bit about last week was uh, this development of doctrine. Uh, I, I can't remember who said this, and I wish I could give the credit where credit is due, but somebody said um, that development of doctrine is, is actually almost like uh, making true inference from a true inference. Uh, in, in other words, if, if Mary is the mother of Jesus, and Jesus is God, then Mary is the mother of God. The, it, do, you, do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And uh, it, it would, that would almost be considered, I mean, greater minds than and much more spiritual hearts than mine have given that great, great thought and a lot of reflection and have come up with these incredible truths uh, regarding Mary. Uh, how about... Um, uh, did you have any trouble at all with the with the priesthood? No, not really. That that wasn't an issue because I believed in authority of some sort. I just didn't understand the nature of Catholic authority. Mm -hmm. and when you're evangelical, it's basically you know the, the stereotype is me, the Bible, and the Holy Spirit. Right. And in effect, in practice, that boils down to whatever my opinion is. We could rationalize away just about anything. Mm -hmm. You're right. You know, I, I would hope that I didn't do that, but but that's the tendency of human nature. When you bring in private judgment, and and being Americans in particular, we're not one one to really, uh, you know, we never had a king and that sort of thing. So so we're not accustomed to submitting to authority. That's considered un-American. I think that enters into it, too, the, where people think that the Catholic Church is sort of un-American, mm. because then you're subject to a pope who's in Rome, you know. There, there's a lot of different factors that I'm interested in history of ideas and epistemology and how people arrive at what they believe. And with this issue, I'm convinced there's a lot of secondary factors and influences that that predispose someone to accept or reject an idea. That's right, yeah. And I've, um, I'm kind of big on that myself, that uh, the, I call it the Americanization of the gospel. Yes. Uh, we've we've seemed to have taken the teachings of Jesus and, and, and everything and, and tried to make them fit our fast food, uh, fast everything, want it now, uh, American lifestyle. Uh, and it's uh, that's I, I get a, a tremendously blessed when I when I read some of the saints, uh, the autobiographies of some of the of, of the church's saints, and especially the very very early church fathers, uh, because there was no Americanization of the gospel then. Uh, they lived for Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone, um, without trying to get whatever they could out of it at the same time. Um, I know that one of the uh, the issues that seems to be a, 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 a large, a big hang up for most evangelicals who are considering converting to the Catholic faith, along with the what you mentioned last week in our discussion was the infallibility of the Pope. Mary seems to be a, a huge stumbling block to many, but also uh, the Eucharist. Did you have any trouble with that at all? You know, that was difficult for me to accept uh, the literalness of it because, again, Protestants are more or less trained. Everything is put in the realm of spirit. I think it's a form of... Uh, there's ancient heresies of Gnosticism and Docetism which were which regarded matter as evil. Some of that thought has penetrated into Protestantism where... They would be inclined to to think that a uh, symbolic Eucharist is more um, well spiritual in quotes than an actual one, and that's where it's a it's a radical departure from all of church history, because even Luther believed in the real presence, and he was he was so passionate about it that he would say people like Zwingli who didn't believe it were damned and out of the church. That's a direct quote. <laughs> he had pretty choice words to say. <laughs> and 
And so that, so the point being, even Luther they accepted real presence. He accepted baptismal regeneration. He even believed in the Immaculate Conception. If, if any, if Protestants think I'm exaggerating, that's that can be documented by Lutheran sources. So, so he had a very Catholic Mariology that's been lost. It's really with Calvin that, that present-day Protestantism begins in all its essentials. You, um, in your conversion story, had, uh, had said that you were quite a fan of uh, Martin Luther. Oh, yeah. I believe you said he was your hero at one point. Uh, and you did you you studied the man's uh, life and his his beliefs and his teachings quite a bit, and that is surprising I think for most Protestants to to learn that what we Catholics believe today Martin Luther believed uh, when he even back when he started what you what you called the revolution, yes. uh, and what, what part of the uh, the Eucharist was it that gave you the most difficulty. Was it the fact that the Catholic Church considers it a, a true sacrifice, or the, that the uh, the bread and the wine actually became the body and blood of Jesus, uh, or what, was there anything in particular, or just the whole concept itself? Yeah, I just thought it was. I guess most Protestants would say, "Well, why, why is that necessary? Why can't you just have?" A remembrance. It, there's a sense in which it's more messy, or um, I'm trying to think of the word. It's just it's not necessary. That they have an aversion. I, I really think it goes back to the, the matter spirit thing, right? Because you see that in Protestantism, uh, even you know, like the again the stereotypes of the fundamentalists are they're against music, they're against dancing. And, Anything that involves physical pleasure, pretty much, you can't drink. I mean, there's wine in the Bible. Drunkenness is wrong, but but just drinking alcohol, that's not biblical. But yet, I think they believe that because they they have uh, insufficient notion of the human body and the and human beings. That pleasure is part of God's creation. What was it then that uh, convinced you of the authenticity of what the Catholic Church said about the Eucharist? Was there anything in particular, or uh, just research, or taking the Church's authority on it? Uh, was there anything in particular for you? No, unlike many converts, I didn't. I didn't really work through every doctrine. Like a lot of my friends would, they'd be studying these doctrines for months. And they try to find it from the Bible, but that's still a Protestant methodology. I mean, I believe that these doctrines can be um, can be defended from Scripture. And that's the whole theme of my website. But they don't have to be explicit in there. And of course, sola scriptura isn't either. You, you can't. I don't think you can find that in Scripture. Right. But so I didn't do that so much as. Um, I changed my view as to the nature of what the church is and the nature of authority and so development was the key to that because it showed me that the Catholic Church did have a consistent principle all through the 2000 years that it wasn't just arbitrary uh, what's called late inventions oftentimes the, the late inventions of the <laughs> Catholic Church I, I just a couple days ago I had a man who has a PhD and a master's in theology I don't know what denomination but he wrote and said well what do you think of Pius the Ninth just pretty much inventing the Immaculate Conception <laughs> no biblical evidence or anything <laughs> that's how he viewed that it's so simplistic and absurd, and coming from someone that educated, it really shows the mindset that they have no inkling whatsoever of development or the sense of the faithful, as Newman talks about. They must think that the uh, just the Pope was, couldn't sleep at night or something and stayed up one night and just decided to invent some sort of a new doctrine 
He had and, a demonic uh, vision, and then he decided to... Yeah, and then came out the next day and proclaimed it to the world. Uh, what's, what's interesting, and especially this is what I find on your website, is that you find... Uh, uh, you, you can you can find the whole history of all of these things uh, um, through all, all of the links and um, and all, all of the people that that you uh, where, where their websites are listed on your website. Well, again, the, the word link uh, you can you can you can trace these things all the way back and find out that, that there's a lot more to it than just some pope coming out someday and saying, "Hey, guess what? Mary was immaculately conceived." Uh, you can trace it all the way back and find the discussion in the early the early church and and so on. We had talked last week um, about the uh, when we were talking about the development of doctrine. We had talked about the development of the Bible, uh, how that came to be the New Testament, especially well, even even the Old Testament to a degree, but the uh, the New Testament. We have. Uh, a difference in the Protestant and Catholic Bibles, is that right? Yeah, we have, I think it's uh, seven more books. Now, where uh, do, did you have any difficulty with that at all when you were converting to the Catholic faith? Um, not particularly. I guess I had never, I might have read a few of those books. Mm -hmm. Obit, I think I had a college course where I read that. But, I studied a little bit about it, I think it was after I converted. So you took more, um, a lot of things. I've always said that one of the things that um, that is really, if you can get over these two hurdles, then I think you can accept most of what the Catholic Church teaches, or uh, people who are, are converting. Number one is, is just to accept the teaching position of the Pope and the authority that Jesus Christ gave to the Holy Father in succession through St. Peter, number one. And number two, just by looking at what Jesus Christ said about the church and what the church would be and what the church would do, and then, of course, what St. Paul said about what the church was going to be and do. If you could accept the authority of the church and accept the authority of the Pope as they are presented in Scripture, uh, then for the most part, Although some doctrines are difficult to understand, uh, once you can take everything on the authority of the church and the authority, uh, the authority of the pope, you're, you're basically, you're almost home. <laughs> well, then, then the charge, of course, is, well, you're just throwing away your mind. Oh, boy. Uh, you know, I've never used my mind so much. <laughs> Honest. Uh, I mean, until I you know, was challenged on, on these doctrines and challenged on what I believed as a Catholic and what the Catholic Church taught, um, when somebody challenges you, that's when your mind goes to work. And, uh, exactly, and we get challenged a lot, don't we? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, yeah, we get challenged a lot more than we would like it. But again, it's something that you had mentioned last week. If the deity of Jesus Christ had never been challenged... Uh, the, it, the, the Council of Nicaea would have, would have had no uh, reason to come up with what we call the Nicene Creed. And all of these beliefs, it's, it's the challenges that clarify what we believe. Um, and, of course, uh, every, every council that's ever been called has always been in, in some uh, uh, response to a challenge somewhere. Um, I'm really... I admire the, the work that, that you're doing. I don't know where you find the time. Uh, you know, I know that you've got, you've got a full-time job, you've got a wife, and you've got children. And you've been taking this website that uh, I know that just in the past uh, week and a half ago or something, <laughs> I saw that you mailed out a, a little, uh, an email that said, you know, please, uh, I, I'm not going to be able to start responding personally to every single email that comes in. Are you swamped? Uh, well, I get a fair number. That, that particular email, I was just saying, I don't want to get uh, other lists or people having discussions because I can't follow all of them. Right. But I do answer the email, anything that comes in about the website. A lot of times I'll refer them to a paper because that's that's why they're there, to provide answers, you know. 
right? What, what does it take? Now, I, see, I'm not, I'm kind of computer illiterate. Uh, I can get around, I can get to your website, I can get to EWTN's website, and, and most of the, the major ones that I need. And of course, I, I also get to things like Chick Publications and some of the anti-Catholic uh, websites, because I want to see what, what they have, um, what kind of new things they're bringing up, uh, and how best to respond to them and everything. Old things. Yeah, old things, you're right, you're right. It's, it's nothing that's new. It's been around since the inception of the church. Well, what does it take to maintain something like that? I don't, you know, I mean, you must be constantly flooded with, um, with, with new links and new, new, new additions to it. How do you handle all of that? Oh, well, it isn't too bad. You have to remember, I've, I've been working on this, it's now two years and four months. So it, you just, you keep building on it like a skyscraper. So what appears overwhelming, if you realize it's been through constant work for two years, then it's, uh, I figure if I get every link that's out there, then no more can come in. And <laughs> <laughs> You'll have, you'll have it all swallowed up on your own. Is it expensive? I mean, it's something you've got to maintain on your own. Is that right? Yeah, I do it all myself. Wow. Um, I, I don't watch a lot of TV. That'll help. <laughs> <laughs> well, your, your wife and your, your your children, God bless them. Oh, they're very understanding, yeah. I guess. Dave, um, we're coming down to the last few minutes again in the program. And uh, I appreciate your, your, your sharing with us. Uh, has your walk with Jesus, I, I, I know the initial blast of, of conversion. Um, now, not everybody experiences that. There are many who, who may have a born-again experience, you can call it, where it's, it's gradual. They come to, to know and to understand Jesus only over a period of time. Uh, I've got many friends that are like that right now. They're, they're, they're making a journey towards Jesus. There are others of us who um, have been almost like Paul, uh, kind of bowled over by the sudden realization that, hey, Jesus Christ is real. God is real. When that, um, how, how do you, as a, as, a, as a convert, I'm trying to word this in the proper way, as a convert coming into the Catholic Church, and many of our uh, Catholic brothers and sisters are accused of being uh, not as full of vin and vinegar as everybody. Uh, they, they don't seem to have this excitement about them. Uh, how do you deal with that? Do you, do you sometimes look around in the, in, in the Mass, for example, and say, boy, I wish everybody had the fire that I feel? Uh, well, I mean, I don't always feel fire myself. Well, <laughs> that's right. It helps. Uh, the Internet is made for the Catholic Church, I think, because our doctrines and theology are all interrelated and interconnected, and it, it's made for that. Right. But in terms of keeping the fire, I, well, I, I go back to Scripture again, where you didn't have a situation with a bunch of perfect saints. If you read what Paul said to the Galatians and even the Romans, if you read the the seven churches in Revelation, what well, that was Jesus talking to them. They had a host of problems. Paul talks about one uh, or the Corinthians. I think there was incest going on there and yeah. immorality, drunkenness, debauchery. It sounds a lot like today. So that's right. That's right. <laughs> nothing really changes. Yep. It, yep. So that's another myth that has to fall on close examination that the early church was not perfect. We're not perfect today. God never promised that. What he promised was infallibility and indefectibility of doctrine. You know, that, so pope, even popes are not perfect saints. But we do have saints, too. It's just it's a different question from the question of the true church. That's an issue that uh, something we just touched on just now that, that we deal with quite often and is greatly misunderstood. Uh, that you're right, popes are not perfect people. Uh, they are not even our present pope is, is a saintly and holy man as he is. Pope John Paul II still goes to confession uh, every week. Um, 
and he he is not he's he doesn't have he can't give you the 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 whole thing of infallibility doesn't mean that he's never going to make any errors or he's not going to uh, make a subtraction a uh, subtraction problem he's, he's going to come out perfect every time um, he he learns the same as we all learn through uh, through the study of scripture and the reflection of scripture and through church history. Uh, and it's just this divine gift uh, that when he does exercise this infallible gift of infallibility, uh, that Christ promises that he won't feed us any poison. Uh, he won't teach us any error. It's always been the same. I use the analogy of, you say that our popes are sinners. Well, what about the Bible writers? You have Moses and David who killed people, and David committed adultery. Right. All persecuted Christians. God used them. Peter betrayed Christ, but all these people were used in tremendous ways. That's right. They weren't perfect. That's right. In fact, it almost seems that those that strive, or not don't strive, but those who, who would try to claim to be perfect, um, God has no way to use them. They're too full of themselves. Excellent, yeah. David, thank you very much again for your... Um, your participation in our program. You're a tremendous blessing. Again, keep up the good work uh, on your website. Coming from that type of Christianity, there are a lot of issues to deal with. Uh, I know that, and I'm, I'm sure you know that too. And that's what I want to talk about a little bit tonight. I want to know how you, how did you deal with issues like, and I'm going, to, I'm going to bring someone, I'm going to ask for your opinion on them. Um, one of them that we talked a little bit about last week was the issue of the infallibility of the Pope. Uh, but through Scripture, if we could, I want to spend some time just talking personal issues. Um, I am a revert uh, to the Catholic faith. I was... Um, raised a Catholic and had left the Catholic Church for a period of time, and now I'm back. Uh, but the, that's not the story that we're going to tell tonight. The story that we're going to tell tonight, I want to hear from you. Uh, you have, last week we had a special guest, Dave Armstrong, uh, who uh, gave us a, um, a, a great teaching on the development of doctrine, what the Catholic Church means about this development of doctrine. And we're fortunate enough that uh, Dave is going to jo join us again. Through the miracle of electronics, um, he hasn't been on hold for a week here on the telephone, uh, but we do have Dave with us again tonight. Dave? Hello? You still with us? Still here. Okay. It's a long time waiting for a week. <laughs> you are a convert to the Catholic faith. And in talking to, especially from evangelical Protestantism, which really had no uh, sacraments, no, um, at least no uh, refined liturgy or high liturgy or anything like that. Uh, I know I was, I, I, when I left the church for a while, that's what I was, uh, that's what I went to, uh, was just a very basic Bible only um, type of Christianity. <laughs> I hate to see your phone bell. <laughs> Last week, Dave, we got into some, um, uh, we were talking kind of, uh, what would you call it, I guess, um, educationally or technically uh, about some, some issues uh, such as the development of doctrine and, and how uh, Cardinal Newman uh, had written his essay and how that brought you even more firmly into the Catholic faith. Um, I wanted to ask you tonight,